same time, Maria's next door neighbor, a big 20-year-old man named Alessandro Serenelli, started to take an impure liking towards Maria. Now, at first, he would say rude and crude things to her, things that were embarrassing and inappropriate, and that would cause her to run away. And the more she reacted, the more he liked her. But he eventually revealed to her he wanted her to give up her virginity to him, and that he wasn't going to take no for an answer, and that if he needed to hurt her very badly to get what he wanted, then so much the better. Now, Maria wanted nothing to do with Alessandra, but you see, she was in a very difficult position. She didn't have a father around to protect her, and her mother was at her wit's end trying to keep up with the demands of that farm. And Alessandro had manipulated the situation in that he would assist her mother with some of the more difficult farm tasks. So Maria's mother viewed Alessandro as a friend, as a good neighbor. For that reason, Maria didn't reveal to her mother what Alessandro was threatening her with, because she knew if she did so, then her mother would sever the relationship between the family and Alessandro by moving the family away. And the family had nowhere to go. So if it came to that, the family may not survive. But one day, when Alessandro knew Maria was home alone, he approached the house with an object identical to this one. And he placed the end of that file against Maria and said to her, Maria, unless you do, what I want you to do, I will kill you. Maria refused. In his anger, he stabbed Maria over that file nine times. And he stabbed her with such force, the file entered her body on one side and came out the other for six of the nine wounds. For the three that didn't, they didn't because he hit her spine. And he hit her spine so hard, he bent the file. Maria fell to the floor of her kitchen unconscious. He thought he had killed her, but at this point, she was only unconscious. And he went next door, and he locked himself inside his room. At a certain point, Maria regained consciousness, and she managed to drag herself along the floor of her kitchen to the door, which was about six feet away. And she managed to reach up and flip the latch, pulling the door closed, so that she could make an attempt to open the door and cry for help. Alessandro heard her flip that latch, and he came back and he stabbed her five more times. It was these second wounds that would kill Maria 24 hours later. He pierced her intestines. And what began to happen was an outflowing of the contents of her intestines into her body. And this causes an infection known as peritonitis, the same infection you would get if your appendix burst. By the time Maria was found, she already had a fever. By the time she was taken to the hospital, which was a great distance away, the fever, combined with the loss of blood she had sustained, put her in a state of dehydration. And so upon arriving at the hospital, she begged the doctors over and over for water. But the doctors wouldn't give her any water because whatever she would swallow would come out her perforated intestines and would induce peritonitis. And they were trying to save her. It was a local priest who had been called to the hospital that posed this question to Maria. He asked her, Maria, our Lord from the cross also begged for water, but no one gave him it. Will you also offer up your thirst for sinners? And she replied, yes, Father, I will. And she never asked for anything again. They performed surgery on her to try to stop the internal bleeding, but because she had lost so much blood, they didn't give her any anesthetic. They didn't think that her heart was strong enough. They thought if she were given anesthetic, that would induce cardiac arrest. And so throughout that surgery, in which they enlarged every one of Maria's wounds so they could suture her eternally, Maria felt every movement of the surgeon's blade and hands. Throughout that surgery, Maria never cried out and never complained once. She offered everything up for the salvation of sinners. When they were done the surgery, the internal bleeding continued, and so it was clear Maria would not survive. But before she died, she said these words, I forgive Alessandro Serenelli, and I want him with me in heaven forever. She died. Alessandro, for his part, was taken to trial at which he pleaded innocence. He said he was defending himself from the attack of Maria Goretti. Just as you don't believe him, neither did the judge. And he was sentenced to 30 years in prison. And it is said, Alessandro Serenelli went to prison, the most angry man on earth. 
He blamed Maria for everything and kept repeating over and over again how if she, if she had just done what he wanted her to do, none of this would have happened. And in fact, he was so filled with anger, he couldn't be allowed to mix with the other inmates because he would always cause violence when he was permitted to be around anyone else. And so he was locked in isolation, placed in solitary confinement, separated from every other inmate, and he remained in isolation for six years until one night. One night, Maria appeared to him. And she didn't say anything to him, but she appeared in a garden picking 14 white lily flowers. And she handed those flowers to him one by one. The number 14 is significant because it was 14 times that he had stabbed her. So with this gesture, what Maria is saying to Alessandro is, I forgive you. Well, that act of forgiveness, that act of love, filled Alessandro with light and with the Holy Spirit. And he immediately became contrite for what he had done to that little girl. He asked for the local bishop and he requested the sacrament of reconciliation, at which he confessed having murdered her. And shortly after that occasion, there were tens of thousands of these little prayer cards printed up, just like you see on the screen, and they were distributed all over Italy and Europe. They had an image of Maria Doretti on one side and a prayer asking God to grant her canonization as a saint on the other. One day there was a construction worker digging at the base of a building in Rome. From the top of the building, a large stone block fell onto his foot, completely crushing his foot. Damaging it so badly, shattering every bone within it, nothing could be done to repair it. All they could do was prepare the man for an amputation they would perform the following morning. But his wife, who had been called to the hospital, placed one of those prayer cards in and amongst his bandaging. The next day, they placed the man on top of the operating table, and they had the saw ready to begin cutting into his leg. When they removed his bandaging, they discovered there was not a single thing wrong with his foot. There were no broken bones. There was no bruising. There was not a scratch on that man's foot. There was nothing wrong with that foot. That man got up off the operating table and went right back outside to work. He never missed a single day's work. All because Maria chose to forgive. Because she chose to be a saint. And because Maria made that choice, Alessandro Cerinelli, having received the mercy of God through the forgiveness of Maria, began to live a holy life himself, even within prison. He began to read the Bible, he developed a prayer life, and he would evangelize the other inmates. And he was released after 27 years. He had been sentenced to 30 years in prison, but he was released three years early because his person had completely changed. In those days, nobody was let out early. One of the first things he did upon his release was seek out and find the mother of Maria Goretti. He approached the door of her house and knocked on it. Now for you to understand what happened next, I have to go back in time slightly. Maria's job in the family was to have the role of mom. She was in charge of all the domestic responsibilities. When Maria died, there was no one left able to take her place. And her mother couldn't both look after the responsibilities of the farm and meet the needs of her family. So the same week that Maria Goretti died, her mother had to give up all five of her main children to adoption. Alessandra didn't just murder her little girl, he destroyed her family. She never even got to go to Maria's funeral because it was held on one of the last days that she had with her remaining children. 27 years later, there's a knock on her door, and she opens the door. And there she is standing face to face in front of the man that had brought so much misery upon her. He asked her, Asunta, do you know who I am? And she replied, yes, I know who you are. He asked her, do you forgive me? And she replied, Alessandro, God has forgiven you. Maria has forgiven you. How can I not forgive you? And she accepted him that day as her own son, and 
she had died. That was December 24th, 1934, Christmas Eve. And they both went to midnight Christmas Mass together and received Holy Communion side by side. Maria Assunta Garetti and her daughter's murderer, all because Maria chose to forgive. Because she chose to be a saint. And because Maria made that choice, her mother had the glory and honor of being present at St. Peter's Square when the Holy Father, Pope Pius XII, proclaimed her little girl a saint and raised her to the glory of the church's altars. In the history of the Catholic Church, that event has no parallel. Never, except in the case of Maria Goretti, has a parent of the saint been present to witness the canonization. And on that date in June 1950, over half a million people descended upon St. Peter's Square to witness the canonization of that little girl. That was the largest crowd in the history of the Catholic Church to that point in time. A crowd so large that for the first time in its history, St. Peter's Basilica, the largest church in the world, a church that could easily hold over 250 of your churches inside it, that was the first time in its history it could not be used for a canonization because it was too small. And so Maria's canonization was the first one to be held outside in the square. And because Maria made that choice, Alessandro Cirinelli went on to live a very holy life himself. In fact, I believe he too one day will be canonized as saint. He ended up becoming a Franciscan Capuchin lay brother and he lived such a transformed existence of holiness, and piety, and service, and was so renowned for his intercession, that there was a movement today to begin his cause for canonization. There having been claims of numerous miracles performed by his intercession following his death, some I've witnessed with my own eyes. But friends, this story would not turn out this way. This story would not have the happy ending that it does had Maria not made that very difficult choice that she did, had she not chosen to forgive, had she not chosen to be a saint. You see, nobody in the world would have blamed Maria for not forgiving Alessandro. Who would blame her? He wanted to do ugly things to her, and he attacked her brutally because she wouldn't cooperate. And here's the kicker. He had no repentance in his heart whatsoever. None. He didn't want to be forgiven. But Maria didn't put her faith in a situation. She put her faith in God. That God whom she loved, she knew, demands the forgiveness of our enemies. And if that's what my God wants for me, she thought, then that's what he's going to get from me. And because she made that choice, that little 11-year-old girl left this world a saint. This month, it is the anniversary of my being at a church along the Gulf Coast. I was approached by a young man, 18 years old. He had come down with cancer in his left thigh. How he had become aware that he had a problem is he had been standing on his leg several days prior and the bone snapped. He went to the hospital and the doctors discovered the cancer had eaten too much of the bone for the leg to be saved. And so they scheduled him for an amputation he would perform in one week's time. Three days before that surgery was scheduled is when he came to see me. He came asking the final of the saints if that could help him. I remember that Maria had saved that man's foot from amputation. I told him her story, just like I've told you. Afterwards, I said to him, Maria was able to accomplish such a great good because she gave Jesus exactly what he wanted. I said to him, Maria did not negotiate with God. Why don't you do the same? Why don't you make an act of forgiveness towards everyone who has ever hurt you, even if you've already forgiven them ten times in the past? Just renew that forgiveness now in honor of Maria. Afterwards, I'll place a relic on your leg and say a prayer asking God for your healing. In the course of our talking, he revealed to me that as a young boy, he had been hurt very badly by a certain individual, and that that hurt had been prolonged over a number of years and that he was still very much, to this day, experiencing the effects of that hurt. 
And so I said to him, not because that person who hurt you deserves forgiveness. No one deserves forgiveness. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But so that God can do something beautiful in your life and in that person's life who hurt you, just like he did in Maria's and in her murders, are you willing to forgive in imitation of Maria? And so he agreed. He made an act of forgiveness for everything he had experienced at the hands of that individual. Afterwards, I asked him, are you willing to forgive yourself for everything you've ever done for which you would hold yourself in contempt or self-hatred? And you know what, friends? He had a much more difficult time with that one. And that's what I have noticed in my entire priesthood. Almost always, the hardest person to forgive is that person staring back at us in the mirror. And so I said to him, if you refuse to forgive God's, if you, if you, if you refuse to forgive yourself, you cannot receive God's grace. Because you would be denying someone the mercy he wants you to give even though in this case you are both the giver and the recipient. And I said to him, Bud, right now, you need all the grace you can get. And so he agreed to forgive himself, and he made an act of forgiveness for everything he had ever done for which he held himself in disdain. I took Maria's relic, placed it on his leg, and said a prayer asking God to heal his leg through the intercession of St. Maria. Three days later, he went to the hospital for his amputation. In the operating room, they opened his thigh. And they found no cancer. And they found no broken bone. They closed his leg up again, and there's nothing wrong with that young man's leg today. All because Maria chose to forgive. Because she chose to be a saint. You see, friends, Maria is not dead. She has never been more alive. And she has taught us the reason why you were created, the reason why I was created, is to be a saint. And the only tragedy in life, and there is only one, is if we leave this world not having become a saint. And she has even taught us what it takes to be a saint. It means saying yes to God and to his will in every circumstance and situation. It means putting our faith in God and not in the circumstances and situations in which we find ourselves. This brings me to the end of my presentation. With me, please recite this closing prayer. Almighty and ever living God, by whose gift we venerate in one celebration the merits of all the saints, be so on us to be prayer through the prayers of so many intercessors, an abundance of the reconciliation with you, for which we earnestly long. with you.